Oh, we are live. It is good to see you, everybody. It's the Elizabeth Alfano Show right here on WCGO. I want to thank everyone for being with me today. Of course, you know that if you can't get to your radio dial on 1590 AM and 95.9 FM, you can always just say, hey, Alexa, play me WCGO. And you can also go to WCGORadio.com. Okay, I want to take everybody through the news because that's what I love to do. Uh, if you have been following in the New York Times, there was a great article last week uh, by Jonathan Saffron Foyer, and he wrote a wonderful piece, The End of Meat, and he talks about a lot of things in it, but I want to take on one subject in particular. If we let the factory farm system collapse, won't farmers suffer? No, the corporations that speak in their name while exploiting them will. There are fewer American farmers today than there were during the Civil War, despite America's population being nearly 11 times greater. This is not an accident, but a business model. The ultimate dream of the American agricultural industrial complex is for farms to be fully automated. Transitioning towards plant-based foods and sustainable farming practices create more jobs than it would end. In addition, he says, if for a single year the government removed its $38 billion plus in props and bailouts and a required meat and dairy corporations to play by the normal capitalist rules, it would destroy them forever. The industry could not survive in a free market. So uh, I just want to tell everybody that's a great article if you have a chance to read it. I also uh, saw another article which was sort of disturbing about the data and how hard it is to get it from factory farms about what their infection rate actually is. Um, the Times found this in some uncovered emails. Emails revealed the deference of some county officials to have shown this deference towards the giant meatpacking companies and how little power they have in pushing the companies to stem outbreaks. Bad news spreads faster than the truth, said a county health official in Colorado of an outbreak at a Cargill plant, according to notes from a conference call last month. At this point, we're not doing anything to cast them in a bad light. We will not throw them to the press. This makes no sense to me because we need transparency. It is our health after all. Uh, makes absolutely no sense. But something that does make sense is that China is investing more heavily than ever in plant-based foods. Nestle just put in over a million dollars for a fully uh, plant-based only kind of plant. And that to me makes a lot of sense. Uh, something else that makes a lot of sense and a lot of joy for me is uh, to have Matthew Kenny with me here in studio. You can sort of see my studio today is a kitchen. Matthew Kenny, chef extraordinaire, thanks for being with me today. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Uh, so I want to give you a little bit of background on who you are and just how great you are. I will say that personally, you changed my life when I stumbled in to plant food wine in Los Angeles on Abbott Kinney Avenue in Venice. I didn't even know that these things were possible. For people who may not know of you, I will say that you have about 40 plus restaurants around the world all plant-based. You are an award-winning James Beard chef, two times over, I believe, rising star. And you also have the Food Future Institute, which we're going to get into, uh, your cooking school that is now open to everyone, I believe, and so reasonable. So I really want to get into that. Um, but first, let me just ask you, how long have you been at this? Well, I became a chef in 1989, so I, I have to do the math on that. But I, that's when I went to a French Culinary Institute. And um, after 12, 14, 13 years, I went fully plant-based. So plant-based about 18, 19 years. And how long has, I'll say, the, the Matthew Kenny cuisine empire? Because it really is an empire. When you go on the website and you say, like, oh, my gosh, they're in Bogota. They're in Bahrain. They're in... Uh, Argentina, Buenos Aires. I mean, and of course, they're in Philadelphia, too. And they're in Chicago and Los Angeles and New York. Um, it really is an empire. When did you say to yourself, like, OK, I'm going to change the world with food, really? Well, I said that from day one to myself, but it was a little, uh, a little too ambitious. The market wasn't ready. And the, the reality is um, I had I was challenged for many, many years um, to bring, you know, plant based to upscale dining and and to the mainstream. So it started in 2002, but it wasn't really until, you know, three or four or five years ago where things really started to come together and make sense from a business perspective. And also not even, it's not even about finance. It's just about attracting uh, strong teams 
to the mission, to what we're doing, and um, because obviously can't do this by myself. Um, so things started to click a few years ago, but I mean, I, I had the vision from day one. I really felt like plant-based cuisine, if done properly, could change the way we think about food. Yes, and and it does. I mean, um, when I think of again, I think it's over forty restaurants that you have. I the only plant based chain business model I'll say that I know of is Veggie Grill. Obviously, a very completely different market that you're going after. I really don't know of much, and I'm surprised at this point. I don't know of much fine dining going on in the plant based world. I'm wondering if you could tell me why that is. It's, it's all timing. Uh, you know, there are so many factors that have allowed plant-based to become more prevalent in the last few years. Um, you know, the media and all the education that the media has done through documentaries and, and films, um, studies, you know, by doctors and committed medical professionals who are, are now, you know, embracing plant-based diet, which wasn't the case necessarily so long ago, not so long ago. Um, can't ignore the, the, the financial markets, like for example, mm -hmm. Beyond Meat, you know, all of these things have to come together, marketing, finance, operations, the know-how, and it, it wasn't going to happen overnight and it's still evolving. Um, but these days, you know, it's become fashionable to uh, dine plant-based. doesn't mean it always has to be fine dining. It could be fast food. It could be picking up a snack at a store, but it, it, it just, the market had to come around and the larger uh, groups, especially hotels and so forth, had to embrace it before it could really become as acceptable as it has. Uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit. As you say, you can't do this on your own. It seems that you've partnered with a lot of hotels around the world. And I was wondering why that business model for you, rather than having your own individual restaurants. Well, in the United States, most of our restaurants are company owned um, and operated, but internationally, and we have about 16 or 20, uh, I don't know the exact numbers, uh, international projects. And, you know, we don't understand those markets. We don't always even speak the language or understand the, the, the systems and the rules and regulations. So it's much more effective for us to do what we do best, which is create the food, develop the concept, help with the marketing and work with really strong teams in regional markets um, that have the know-how and the real estate. Um, and that's a great way for us to grow without trying to figure out something that we may never figure out. So hotels are, you know, we have a lot of different types of partners. We're in Saks Fifth Avenue, we're doing project with Aloe Yoga, and we work with, you know, several hotel groups and so forth. But hotels are great because they have the real estate, they have the spaces, and, and mm -hmm. it's wonderful if we can actually uh, bring plant-based into their infrastructure. Yes, it is wonderful because you automatically have that captive audience. And so you're teaching, exposing people to uh, plant-based in a way that is um, so easy. It's just such an easy entry point for them. Yeah, and they're trained, you know, like we work with Four Seasons Hotels um, in four locations and they have such an incredible uh, training program and culture that, you know, we don't ever have to worry about the quality. Like once we work together with their teams and, and come up with a dish, we know it's going to be executed perfectly. Yes, it's wonderful to have your partner already vetted like that, really. Uh, I hate to go to break, but I will be right back with Matthew Kenny. It's the Elizabeth Alfano Show on WCGO. Thanks for being with us, everybody. That's segment one of the radio show. Matthew hopped in at the last minute on his phone. So I appreciate that, Matthew, for doing that. Um, we're going to get into it right now, all about your love of raw food. So everybody, here we go. Oh, we're back. It's the Elizabeth Alfano Show on WCGO. I have extraordinary international chef Matthew Kenny with me. He is a rising star, according to James Beard, several times over. And more than anything, he has this um, incredible empire of plant-based fine dining restaurants, which I just love. Um, tell me, a lot of your restaurants, Matthew, are raw food. Tell me your interest in that. Uh, um, well, I love raw food. We, we actually... Um I started my first few years as plant-based, um, as a plant-based chef and entrepreneur. We're focused on raw food, and I still love raw food, and that's how I eat most of the day until the mm. evening because I love cooking pasta. Um, but uh, you know, we do have we incorporate raw food into a lot of our places, but I would say it's a smaller percentage now that are strictly raw food. We're actually opening our first 
sort of full service restaurant that's raw um, in New York sometime this year. And, um, but it's just, you know, it's great. The, the food's so cleansing and full of oxygen, full of color and vibrant, um, makes you feel incredible. So I love it. I love the challenge and um, it, it's indescribable. At the same time, I love pizza. So it's, <laughs> I'm not discriminating. Okay, so let's talk about that a little bit. So I um, am relatively close part of the year to a restaurant called Double Zero, which I love. It's got the most incredible pizza. I'm telling you people, potato on pizza. You didn't think it was possible. It's the bomb. So if you can get to Los Angeles or New York, great options there. And then I stumbled upon plant-based, plant food wine and, and Abbott Kinney when I was just going vegan maybe five years ago. And I thought to myself, like most people do, okay, cheese is going to be the sticking point. Cheese is going to be really tough for me. And I just don't know. I'm going to try to go vegan, but let's just see how it lasts. And then on a rainy day, I stumbled in this gorgeous white restaurant. We couldn't eat outside, which is even more beautiful, but we ate in the all white restaurant. It was just the two of us. And we ordered the entire menu pretty much. I'm not kidding because we wanted to try. We didn't know that these things were even possible. And your cheese plate made me say, that's it. It's possible. I don't ever have to go back. It was life affirming. Cheese is like, it's one of the hardest things for people who are transitioning to, um, to plant-based to give up and it's delicious. And yeah, it's a big focus for us actually. Our test kitchen, we have a test kitchen where several of our, our really talented chefs are always innovating and trying new things. And right now our test kitchen looks like a cheese factory. We have every type of cheese imaginable, uh, rinded and so forth, aging and curing. And um, so we're, we're always like pushing the boundaries with cheese. Yeah. And it's a, it's a great thing that trips everybody up. So if you can get the answer to cheese, which I believe, help me out here, your cheeses are all raw, right? Uh, mostly. Um, not all. We, we have um, started to experiment to do a mozzarella with rice or cauliflower. Um, and sometimes, you know, the, the water is boiled, but most of the cheeses historically have been raw, but we're, we're experimenting now with a lot of new ideas. So um, expect us to have a, a full blown cheese concept in the next few months. Okay. I'm holding you to that because I really need that. Um, well, and I think in Los Angeles, you have a test kitchen, right? Where you really experiment on all your ideas or is that in New York? It's in, it's in uh, Venice, uh, MKTK. We have, um, a test kitchen with all the gadgets and tools and dehydrators and thermal immersion and smokers and smoking guns. And so we, yeah, we develop um, not only recipes there. I mean, when we're opening a new restaurant, for example, somewhere in another part of the world, we develop the, uh, the recipes there and photograph everything and test it. And then sometimes we do training there. Like if we have opening a restaurant in South America, the chef from Argentina may fly to LA and train with our chefs in our test kitchen. So that when we get to the restaurant opening, there's a little bit of a, you know, head start. Um, but we're also developing ideas for products that we're doing. We developed the curriculum for the education there. Um, now we're developing um, uh, uh, all the content for this nationwide um, meal plan service we're creating. So yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a great place. You walk in and you're surrounded by ideas and food and innovation and very, very talented team uh, working there. Well, let's talk a little bit about one of your innovations at the moment, which is the Food Future Institute. If the technology gods are with me, I'm going to be able to play a short video for everybody. Let's see if I can do it. Um, and I'm not sure. So I, uh, let me uh, hold on. Yes, I can watch this, everybody. You think I couldn't do it, but now I can. <laughs> Here we go.
I love this. So let's talk about it. Um, is it online now? And who can apply to be part of the Food Future Institute? Uh, yeah, we launched on May 8th, so a little over two weeks ago. Um, it's a 18-module uh, um, course with about 120 lessons. And we expect that the average time to uh, complete the course will be between minimum probably three to four months, but the average will probably be closer to nine uh, nine or 10 months, maybe a year. And it takes, uh, it takes our, our students through the entire um, culinary journey of understanding basic techniques, classic techniques. Of course, we've reformulated the, the techniques and the tools and equipment that are used to fit a plant-based diet. And it's all basically um, brought together through uh, over a hundred original recipes we created um, for this course. The recipes, of course, they're innovative and they're important, but the, the purpose is to make sure that we're weaving in all of these techniques and methods so that everybody can have a deep understanding of, of what's really involved to create plant-based food at a high level. And um, yeah, we went, on, we went live a couple of weeks ago and we have, uh, I think, close to 600 students from, I don't know, 40, 50 countries um, active on the site right now. And what kind of student are you seeing? The accomplished chef who's looking to bring in a couple vegan dishes into their own restaurant or the student who wants to up their game? It's very broad. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we have, well, first of all, it's mostly women. Um, mm -hmm. Women seem to be ahead of men when it comes to, you know, mm -hmm. understanding the value of this. So it's, it's, a, it's a largely uh, female population at the moment. And, um, you know, the demographics are really interesting. We have a, the two largest groups, uh, oddly enough, are, you know, mid twenties and then above my age, which I'm 50, almost 56. So quite Look a few and fly, my, my friend, <laughs> quite a few people in my, um, age group or above as well. And it's very broad. You know, there are chefs, there are quite a few chefs who are chefs in restaurants taking the course. Yeah, but there are also many people who are cooking at home and uh, cooking for their families or might be a yoga teacher that want to bring plant-based food into their private practices. It's, it's really broad. Um, and that's how we designed it. We really yeah. wanted this to be a course for anybody who wanted an entry into uh, plant-based cuisine. It's not an easy course. It's challenging. It's extensive. It's very, very, um, it's probably very intense. But we designed it in a way that anybody could take it um, as long as they're, you know, comfortable handling a sharp knife. Well, what's surprising to me is how accessible the class is, because I believe it's only $350. Is that accurate? It is. We, we had classes years ago, a few years ago, and it was a shorter course. And I think this one's far superior. Um, and that course was three times the price. And most of our uh, most of the other courses online that are similar um, size are over a thousand dollars and um we just really did the math i mean technology mm -hmm. allows you to uh, bring um a service to people at a much lower price and we really just looked at it and we said you know if we can serve this to um hundreds or thousands of people at a time instead of a, a couple hundred and have it be more expensive then you know the the additional support we're going to need to give them the the you know guidance and so forth isn't that bad so we we just we did structured it that way intentionally and it really made sense um i think this is wonderful because th there are over a hundred courses in the program um hopefully let me see if i can write this for everybody it's food future institute.com and uh, you can go there, you can see the curriculum. It's a hundred courses and it's everything from pizza to smoothies, to salads, to casseroles. I mean, it's really, it's all encompassing. So I can see where many chefs would really want to do this already established chefs. Um, I, I'm wondering if we're gonna see, because of your class here, this Institute now, we're gonna see a lot more plant-based fine dining because I always think, you know, what's to cooking some meat? You take the meat, you put it on the frying pan or the grill or whatever, and you basically go away and take a shower. I mean, there's just not a lot of skill here. And 
in my opinion. And so I think for a chef to really show their chops, they have to show me what they do with vegetables. And I don't think many chefs can do it. And so it's disappointing to me, even when I do go, because I try to go to lots of restaurants that aren't vegan. And I ask like, well, hey, where's your vegan stuff? And what you got for me? And, you know, usually it's like order from the sides menu, which is annoying. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a different skill set. I I had to uh, experiment for two years and I, I had a lot of training, classical French training, but it took me a long time to understand the versatility of plants and, you know, how to really make, make them the center of the plate. But the most important thing for, for me, I mean, I come, everybody in our, everybody in the wellness and sustainable plant-based industry has a different hat that they wear. You know, some are activists and some are developing films and some are in finance. And my role as a chef, I, I believe, is to help as many other chefs. And that does not mean restaurant chefs. It means anybody, somebody cooking at home, somebody cooking at a school or on an airplane, but to give them the tools to prepare plant-based food in a way that uh, it is embraced by those who are eating it. And um, so, you know, that's really our mission to, to change the supply chain through the chefs who make the decisions about what products they're buying and what they're serving and what goes on the menu. It makes 100% sense, which is why I'm so happy that foodfutureinstitute.com is here. It's the Elizabeth Alfano Show. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back on WCGO. Oh, Matthew Kenny, you're so great. Your cheese plate really did change my life. So uh, everybody, foodfutureinstitute.com. We've got one more segment on radio. Matthew, I do thank you for being with me. Um, I'm so lucky to be near your restaurants. It's the Elizabeth Alfano show. Oh, we are back on WCGO. I have international chef extraordinaire who runs the empire, Matthew Kenny Cuisine. Matthew Kenny, thanks for being with me. Uh, before break, we were talking about foodfutureinstitute.com where anybody, whether you're a professional chef or not, can take classes. It's only $350, so accessible. And I looked on all the things you need to have under your belt. There's only one funky item, a dehydrator that maybe everybody doesn't have, but otherwise it's, you know, knives and, and frying pans. It's a good amount of equipment, but most people have a good portion of it. And we have 24 hour, we have several chefs who um, uh, run the Institute. And so we have 24 hour live chat, you know, um, and email support. And so there are people who can't find a certain piece of equipment. There are people who may not find a certain ingredient, but you know, we're, they're pretty good at creating a workaround where necessary. I mean, it is good to have a dehydrator, um, it's not that we're using it in all the lessons, but there are a few things that I think are uh, fundamentally important. So if, if somebody has access to it, I would recommend it. Uh, I would absolutely agree. And you can wow your friends and family because as much as I love a, a good plant-based burger like the rest of you, you know, like let's up the game, folks. And Matthew Kenny's really the only game in town for that, which is still sort of surprising for me, but you do such a great job of it. So there's always that. Uh, right before we went to break, you, you were talking about how uh, only women have been interested thus far. They're a little ahead of the men. I just want to show you some very fun pictures. So um, you have a restaurant in Chicago called Althea, one of yes. my favorite places on the planet. I split my time between Los Angeles and Chicago. Chicago's my hometown. So I was having lunch with Dr. Greger. Do you know him? Yeah. Well, not personally, but I, I, I knew about your lunch there. Yes. Yeah, so I took Dr. Greger to lunch and he was amazed. You know, he, all he does is research. I mean, he doesn't head out to, you know, he's not out on the town all the time and he like, couldn't believe it. I love his face here. He's showing yeah. like, and here he was just so happy. We're having a banana cream pie. Um, but so many, so many things he was just like, he couldn't get over it. So, you know, you do have men are interested as well. It's not, oh, yeah. <laughs> I think it's about 20, 25 percent of the, the uh, students are men. And actually, there's there's one uh, chef named Martin that I was just looking at his posts on the on the academy this morning. It's incredible. Um, but, you know, we've seen that with plant based all along, like women are leading. And then it's kind of like yoga. When I started yoga 20 years ago, it was, you know, I was the only male in the, in the class. And now you go and it's like 50 50. So they'll catch we'll catch up. 
Yes, yes. There's hope for you yet. Uh, okay, well, we're talking all about your innovative foodfutureinstitute.com classes. And of course, your restaurants, you have over 40 around the world. And these partnerships with hotels have been so crafty of you. Still, that being said, personally, there are two jobs that I never want to have in my life. And that is be a taxi driver and run a restaurant. I can't think of anything worse. So maybe you could give some tips to those people who do want to run a restaurant. What are some of the pitfalls? And I got to think that's staffing, but I want to hear it from you. And what are some of the joys? I mean, what are some of the tips to running a successful restaurant empire? I mean, the I, I know you had my partner, uh, Sebastiano, um, a couple of weeks ago. So I, wonderful. I think, and he's always telling me to slow down with the restaurants. Um, it's not a great, restaurants are not a great business model. I mean, there are exceptions. We have a couple that, that are phenomenal. Double Zero being one, Plant City is a, more than a restaurant. It's a food hall, incredibly successful, even out there in Chicago. But it's a really challenging business because you're dealing with real estate and, mm. and you know, have to build teams and, and train them and you, have, you need fresh product all the time and the weather changes everything. It's a very tough business. There's no there's no way around it. But I think that um, focusing on one thing is really, um, is really helpful. I mean, that's why double zero, which is pizza and not pizza, a concept like that is a lot easier to manage and operate and, um, and focus on just being the best at one thing. And, you know, everything becomes a little bit easier. It's easier to market it because that's your focus. That's what you do. Of course, that's not, I don't take my own advice, um, but you know, for us, I mean, the restaurants are really important. That's where we bring community together. That's where we meet our guests, our, our teams. You know, some restaurants, some of our places have over 100 people working in, in one place. And this, it's like a symphony, you know. And I mm -hmm. think that it's like anybody who wants to produce a play or a musical or a, or a film. It's just something we do. And we're passionate about it. And the sound of the glasses and, you know, seeing people's eyes when they try something new, it's the rewards in restaurants are not always about finance. As a matter of fact, it's usually the opposite, but there are many other um, rewarding things. And it's like a way to help people understand they can eat and live this way. And for us as a company, it allows us to experiment and find out what, what resonates with our guests. You know, what kind of recipes do people love? And then we can hopefully take those recipes and put them into a more sustainable business model such as media or education or, or consumer packaged goods. So, but on their own, they're tough. No question about it. Um, are you going to be getting into consumer packaged goods? We already are. Uh, we started a product last year called Antidote without the, without the A. Um, it's a, it's a partnership with a um, friend of mine, uh, Dr. Amir Marashi. And it's uh, there are three different bars. It's like a health, health bar and they're all about anti-inflammation great um and we we launched that last year and um and then we started a, a line called plant made foods which is a frozen food line with uh, about 30 different products and um we started shipping in january to about 100 stores so far and um so that's that's you know everything from like a um, cacio pepe to um like an artichoke or heart of palm crab cake. And it's a really cool line. Um, and um, we're working on double zero pizza model, frozen pizza. Um, and we're working on our cheese and a few other things. So yes, we are involved in products. I actually think the frozen market is a great market to get into. Um, there's not that much. I mean, there's Amy's and some things, but there's not that much, particularly on the higher end. But um, just in even the middle of the road, there's not that much that's vegan. And I think that's a category that is ripe for plant-based takeover. It's really helpful to, uh, you know, with college students or to reach people in areas where it might be winter and they don't have access to fresh vegetables Obviously, it's it's quite sustainable because the product doesn't isn't um, isn't going bad quickly. Mm -hmm. So it's an important market. It's not necessarily how I eat every day, but I'm I have frozen foods in my in my freezer. 
Mm -hmm. It's not how I eat either, but um, it's how a lot of people eat. It's really where the majority is. And you often have to meet people where they are. Well, um, basically what we got from your tips for entrepreneurs is that there's no way around the passion and that you got to love it because it is a tricky business. But beyond the passion, I'm wondering if you have maybe top three tips for entrepreneurs thinking of starting a restaurant. Yeah, it's interesting you asked that. The next uh, One of the next courses I'm doing for FFI is about um, – business development within the the um, sustainable marketplace so you know um, I worked with a really intelligent um, partner many years ago and he used to give me all these little nuggets of wisdom and and the first thing which it's not that it's exciting but it's important to realize he said you know he said Matt every business is the same you have to think about marketing mm -hmm. finance and operations because so often we go into a business and we just think about the product or the mm -hmm. operation but understanding the marketing, how are you going to get it to the market, why it's different. And then, of course, the financial aspect um, and not, you know, not just spending or, or not spending, but all of those components are really important. So I think just having a really good basic um, business understanding is important. I think it's, you know, and by the way, that's not how I approach it. I always approach it by thinking, OK, this is a great idea. I want to be <laughs> executing it and hopefully be one of the best in whatever this product or idea that I'm doing is. So, you know, being passionate about it, really having a vision and wanting to be um, unique and the best in something is, is really important. But the most important thing in most businesses, unless it's like a, something you're doing completely by yourself, is your team. And um, that's what I thought about when I, when I set up uh, Matthew Kenny Cuisine. It was creating a platform for really, really talented, passionate people and doing it in a way that, um, you know, that they could grow within that platform. So that's, you know, at the end of the day, that's, that's the most important. Yeah, I, I think um, if, if you're curious about any kind of restaurant model, even though Matthew says like he doesn't follow his own advice, I would get yourself to one of Matthew Kenny's restaurants, so truly the only fine dining plant-based restaurant that I know of, restaurants that I know of, um, you can go to Matthew Kenny, K-E-N-N-E-Y, um, cuisine.com. And they are literally all over the world, as we are right now on the internet and on radio. So you can find one in a city near you. Absolutely. Um, well, I'm wondering if you could give all of us a tip. So even the entrepreneurs not among us, what, sh what dish should everybody know how to make at home? Oh, um... Well, I mean, you're asking a uh, pasta lover, so I don't know. Um, I, I always tell people, I mean, I, I love our heirloom tomato lasagna. It's a raw food dish, and it's something that I created like 18 years ago. And a lot of other chefs have really good versions of it as well. But it's just, I think it's great because it combines all the things people love, like a tomato, a tomato uh, marinara, a pesto, and a macadamia ricotta, which could be made with sunflower or any other seed. And just really good fresh tomatoes and zucchini and herbs and, and olive oil. So I think that's like, that's pretty much what I always recommend to somebody wanting to try to make something plant-based and upscale for the first time. Well, so I would send everybody then to foodfutureinstitute.com because that already seems a little complicated. I love to cook, so it's right up my wheelhouse. But for, for some people starting out, that might be a bit much. So, you know, we're back to taking Matthew's classes. We only have about a minute left, but I've got two quickie questions for you. Um, if you're having a bad day, and sometimes people are having those during coronavirus times, of course, is there a phrase that you say to yourself to get yourself back in the game? I do headstand in my in my office um just get upside down um, um i did one a couple hours ago yeah i uh phrase no i listen to a lot of like talks and, and motivational talks but i usually uh these days i if i'm if i'm having a hard time with something i i've been trying to teach myself how to play piano so oh. um i'll go sit at the piano and and that's you know that's the music that i'm trying to tell myself Mm, I love that. You're switching up your what you're doing. You're just getting yourself out of it into a totally new situation. Uh, just a couple seconds left. One word answer from you. What is your favorite snack? Avocado. Um, mm. Yeah, it's always avocado. It's funny that you say that because lately avocado toast with a little bit of rock salt and lemon has been my jam. And that's all I've been doing lately. Avocado toast. It's so good.
It absolutely needs the lemon. It's critical. It, do it does need the lemon. Uh, we will be right back. It's the Elizabeth Alfano Show on WCGO. Everybody, we got segment three under our belt. Um, Matthew, stay put because now radio's over, but we still have an interview that we can do. I'd love to ask you a couple more questions. Uh, thanks, everybody, for going through the radio show with me. I'd love to know, because you've been at this now for a while, plant-based cooking, what are your predictions for the future? So we all know, at least those here who are dedicated, we're going plant-based. But beyond that, say three to five years, where do you think we're going to be? Well, what I've been working toward and what I've envisioned for the last um, 18 years is a complete um, shift, a global shift in the food paradigm. And what I mean by that is that um, plant-based dining becomes the center of the plate. That's like, like the norm as opposed to, you know, consumption of animals being the norm and then plant-based vegan restaurants over here on the side. I, I really see that changing. I see um, a lot of international chefs embracing that. And I think that most menus, even if they're not vegan restaurants, will consist largely of plants. Um, and it's, it's a big, big shift. And I think that will happen with products. I think it will happen mm -hmm. um, with food service. I think it will happen in homes. And, um, and it's happening really quick. I don't even think it will take five years. I know. I, I am amazed. Every month I change my timeline. I 100% agree with you. We're going to see kind of default veg, which is an organization I interviewed yesterday, actually, if folks want to check it out. They're working to help restaurants and organizations and food service and corporate cafeterias, etc. Just switch it up and that it's veg is the default. And if you want to ask for meat or dairy, you got to ask for it. It's there if you want it, but otherwise the first things you see at the buffet, the first things in line with a ratio of like three to one is veg first. And I think being veg forward is going to be a very quick shift. Agreed. Yeah, which is very exciting. Um, again, kind of a, a thoughtful question before I let you go today. Again, you've been at this for a while, but still we're changing and learning all the time. What do you wish you knew 10 years ago that you know now? I, um, sorry, I'm going to just hit my battery button. Um, oh, wow. I didn't know anything 10 years ago. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um oh, that's a tough one. Um, you know, I think that, um, I, I've learned so much in the last year. It's hard to even fathom like how, how blind I was 10 years ago, but mm -hmm. I think it's not really food related. It's really just about uh, communication and being direct and open and feeling comfortable expressing, um, you know, with and encouraging that back as well. So it's more about interpersonal skills, I think. Mm -hmm. Yes, everything does boil down to relationships, even business. It all really comes down to people. Uh oh, he's still here. Matthew's still here. That was. That was interesting. Can Sorry you hear us? That. Yeah, no worries. Um, it all does really boil down to people. So I know exactly what you mean. And working on those better relationships every day is um, a constant goal of mine as well. Um, Matthew, I just want to thank you for being with me and for all that you do and for futzing with me on some tech stuff and making it over from your computer to your phone. For some reason, and, I can't um, hear you. Oh, you can't hear me? Um, uh, no? No? Okay. Well, um, uh, I'm typing to you very fast. Um, okay. So you still can't hear me? Oh, technology. Uh, everybody, I'm still live, but we have lost Matthew Kenny. Um, he might have run out of battery. We don't know. But luckily, we made it through the radio show. Thanks, everybody, for your patience and for being with me. I thought I would switch it up today and do the interview from my kitchen because I was with famed chef Matthew Kenny. What do you think? Do you like it here? You guys let me know. I know you guys were going crazy on chat. Um, you, you, all you people, Johnny, Tom, Michelle, uh, Lan, thank you all for being with us and for keeping the conversation going. We had a little funny text. Oh, he's back. Wait, hold on. Oh, thanks for hopping back in. I was just saying our goodbyes and our gratitude to you for all that you do. I highly recommend everybody get yourself to a Matthew Kenny restaurant because it is an, it is an experience like no other. And I want you to have that experience to know what it's all about. Plant-based eating is much more than burgers and no one embodies that like Matthew Kenny cuisine. So thank you for all you do, Matthew.
Well, I really appreciate it. Thank you. And My thank pleasure. You for what you do. Oh, so kind of you. Matthew, sit tight. Everybody else, thanks for being with me together. We're taking back our health and the health of the planet. See you tomorrow, everybody. Plant-Based Business Hour. This time, same channel, same place, 1 p.m. See everybody tomorrow. Matthew, stay put.